I'm Barb Anderson. I'm the director of the School of Nutrition and Dietetics, and it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Aaron Hennessy. Aaron is an amazing individual, and I said to her that I've improvised a little bit on what she shared with me because one of the things that you will hear from her by bi her bio is how many things she's been engaged in in her life and. She has a long ways yet to go, so I, I can just only imagine the journey she has yet to take. She was born in northern New Brunswick, but moved to Kingston, Nova Scotia as a young girl. A small town, self-declared preacher's kid, Erin grew up in a family that instilled the importance of, of a strong commitment to community. After high school, she moved to New York City to study musical theater, where she also worked in anti-poverty anti initiatives in her neighborhood. And when she returned to Nova Scotia, she completed a Bachelor of Arts in English and Sociology, followed by a Bachelor of Education, all here at Acadia. And it was in her Bachelor of Arts that I actually first met Erin. She took a nutrition course from me. That's why she knows so much about nutrition. Um, and I remember her very well. So it was a wonderful opportunity to connect with, with a future professional who has done so well in her career. Erin was a founding member of the original Cass Theatre Cooperative, where she helped to develop educational theatre tours for the Canadian Red Cross and the Canadian Mental Health Association. She taught grades primary and one and grade five before returning to university to pursue a dental degree. Erin graduated as valedictorian from Dalhousie University's Faculty of Dentistry in 2004. She was awarded the Canadian Dental Association President's Award, given to the graduate who has shown the most outstanding qualities, qualities of leadership and character, and who may be expected to become a leader in the dental profession, the dental community, and society at large. Following dental school, Erin worked as a dental officer in the Canadian Forces with postings to CFB Kingston and CFB Halifax, both Stadacona and Shearwater. And in 2007, she was selected to work as a dentist on the Canadian Health Measures Survey, the largest health survey of its kind in Canadian history. In 2008, we were very fortunate because Erin and her family returned to the Annapolis Valley where she started working in private practice. She is now the principal dentist and owner of Wolfville Dentistry where she focuses on general family dental practice. In 2011, she was elected to the Nova Scotia Dental Association Governing Council where she sat as the Western Provincial Representative. She's past president and a member of the Annapolis Valley Dental Society and she's a co-organizer of the Dr. John Laba Memorial Dinner, a continuing education event held each year in the Valley. She's also part of AVDS Cares Initiative, in which Valley dentists and volunteers collaborate as a community to provide dental treatment for patients with barriers to care. She's been recently nominated as a Canadian Fellow of the International College of Dentists and is the current president of the Nova Scotia Dental Association. In her spare time, Erin enjoys running, horseback riding, gardening, photography, and travel. And she lives here in Wolfville, Nova Scotia with her son Rory and her husband Jeff. So without further ado, let me present to you Dr. Erin Hennessy. All right, well, thank you so much, Barb. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, in preparing for this event, I, I, I couldn't help but imagine what an incredible opportunity this is and, and to wonder what it would have meant to me when I was sitting in your shoes here at Acadia. So my presentation today is going to be a retrospective of sorts. Um, I plan to walk you through my not-so-textbook journey from actor to dentist but also to talk to you about the courage it takes to listen to your heart and to sometimes change your mind. I've titled my talk, Metanoia. I was introduced to this term by a woman who had known me once as a teenager, but she's now come back full circle into my life as a patient. One day after talking about where life had taken me over the last three decades, she wrote down the word metanoia on a small little sticky note. To be honest, I'd never heard the term before. 
She simply said, just go home and look it up. <laughs> By the end of this talk, I hope you'll understand why. So to start, we're going to go way back to the early 70s. I was a very nervous and socially awkward child. In fact, I preferred to spend most of my time with senior citizens rather than children my own age. No lie. My sixth birthday party was a by invitation only tea party with five senior citizens from the knitting circle at my church. No lie. I apparently told my mother it was because I thought they would behave themselves better than the kids at school. <laughs> However, despite my introverted tendencies, I loved to put on plays, and I'd often cast my older brother and sister and direct them in the roles that I saw fit. And we would spend hours creating these theatrical gems and then perform them on Saturday nights for whoever was around the house to watch. My mom later told me that it gave her great reassurance as a parent because she knew I'd be okay in the long run, because there was confidence hiding in there somewhere. Throughout university, I was definitely an artsy-fartsy. I wore a lot of black, I wrote dark poetry, I listened to a lot of punk music, I hung out with skateboarders and did a lot of photography. I did actually the bare minimum requirements, I hate to admit to you, of anything related to sports, or science. I excelled in anything related to literature, writing, or performance. I had a one-track mind, quite honestly. I was destined to work in theatre. That's what I was going to do, and that was that. Out of high school, I was one of two Canadians accepted to the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York City, and I was planning to study musical theatre. So, at age 18, I was off to the Big Apple to pursue my dream. As a parent now, as a sideline, I can't even imagine what my poor mother was thinking. <laughs> at the time, I lived with three other young women who were students also at the school. This, to, the, uh, to my left, was our apartment, a 500 square foot shared one bedroom with four single beds in it, a small little kitchen that had a bar fridge, shared with some cockroaches, of course, because it's New York City. And this is 1990. We paid $900 US each for that apartment. <laughs> These women were initially my friends, my classmates, and my roommates. But over time, they became my competition in what proved to be an absolute dog-eat-dog -dog world of musical theatre. Suddenly, everywhere I turned, there was catty competition. Relationships were extremely superficial, and I started to realize that maybe I didn't have the thick skin that was required to survive in this world. And I started to hate theater. I did find solace, however, working at this soup kitchen in a church in my neighborhood, where I'd help make and distribute meals to people living on the streets in Manhattan. It was through this community that I met some of the most incredible artists of my career. They used theatre as a medium to reach out to those people in need. I saw how, again, theatre could bring people out of their darkness and provide them with a much-needed voice. I realised that it was that that I loved about theatre, its transformative power to allow people to communicate with one another. So while I decided that I did not have the tenacity to survive the catty side of the musical theatre world, perhaps I realised there was still a place for theatre in my life. When I told one of my soup kitchen theatre friends of my decision to leave theatre school and return home, she told me and confided in me that she too had left the musical theatre world for the exact same reason. She felt it was the wrong fit for her. Before I left to return home, she gave me a beautiful handwritten card that I still have, and it had this quote on it. The secret to change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. This quote has been an extremely important reminder to me over the years, that if we truly listen to our hearts, we can find opportunity in change, rather than fear in change. In returning home, I had to swallow some pride, and I had to swallow my ego, 
because I was constantly having to explain to everybody why I was back from New York City. My 19-year-old self felt embarrassed. I constantly worried that people thought I couldn't hack it in the big city. But standing here now before you as a 45-year-old woman, I look back at that young woman with extreme admiration. So now what? Here I was, returned to Nova Scotia, with a lot of debt, no job, and no sweet clue what I was going to do. As Barb mentioned, prior to moving to New York, I had been a founding member of a small theatre cooperative. We were a collective of writers, musicians, and performers, but we also had a collective shared spirit of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit. Together, we developed a niche in educational theatre, and we secured contracts, as Barb said, with organizations such as the Canadian Red Cross, the Canadian Mental Health Association, and others. And what we did was do school tours, that's me on the left, uh, touring the Maritimes, delivering messages for these organizations, using medium theater as a medium. These school tours provided much needed employment for me throughout university, and it also allowed me to learn the ropes of the business world as well. Our cooperative then successfully bid on a huge contract to provide the entertainment and attraction services at Upper Clements Park, and we did so for several years in the early 90s. During that period, our little cooperative directly employed over 50 people and managed several contracts totaling over a quarter of a million dollars. It provided further employment for all of us as we were through university, working as actors, singers, and musicians. In fact, I spent one whole summer in a bluegrass duo with my now husband, Jeff, your Dean of Arts, <laughs> Jeff Hennessy. <laughs> and it was that summer that I also mastered the washed up bass. <laughs> so during this time, as Barb said, I was enrolled at Acadia, and I, I started with a BA and followed with a BED. I will say that my time at Acadia represented an extremely exciting time of personal growth. I immersed myself in English literature, but I also found a new voice in sociology and a keen interest in psychology. These subjects opened doors to me to different perspectives, and I was challenged to consider concepts like feminism, racism, sexism, and identity. My family's financial situation meant that I was on my own for everything after high school. So when I graduated with my second degree, I decided that before I pursued my MED in musical theater, or, sorry, in educational theater, I needed to work to pay off some debt. I had thankfully forged some great connections with the Valley School Board here in the Annapolis Valley through my educational theater work, so I was able to easily get some subbing jobs right away. Fortunately, I landed a long-term sub position teaching grade primary, grade one, and then the following year I moved on to teach grade five. As much as I loved the teaching, and I absolutely loved these kids, the school system was not an especially happy fit for me. I struggled with many aspects of the day-to-day -day survival in a system which asks and still asks so much more of teachers than what they're paid for. I wrestled with where, I, where did I fit in this world that I had put so much training toward. I was a good teacher, and I knew I was lucky to have a job. However, I pondered. Was that reason enough to just settle in for the long haul? My husband's dad, Jim, is a dentist in Calgary. And whenever we would go to Calgary for Christmas, I would ask to spend hours with him at his office, just fascinated by what he did. I'd take every opportunity to practice writing my name on anything I could with a dental drill. When he arranged, in fact, for a colleague to take out my wisdom teeth, I, in, in, the, in the medical history interview with the surgeon, I actually asked if I could watch what he did in a mirror while he extracted my wisdom teeth, and he just looked at me like I had nine heads and said, that's a first. <laughs> One day, as I peered over my father-in-law's shoulder, as he explained the concept behind the root canal he was doing, he stopped short, pushed back, and said, what are you doing? I was embarrassed, I was horrified. I thought I'd been like a little too close to him and the patient while he was doing his work. So I backed off and apologized and he said, no, Aaron, why aren't you doing this instead of teaching? I burst out laughing, quite honestly. Me, a dentist, 
A real life dentist? Are you kidding me? But he didn't laugh back. He just stared at me. I sputtered something about, well, I'm an artsy fartsy and I have an education degree and I have a lot of debt and I'm a teacher and I have a job and uh, I have no science background. He just shook his head and went back to work. And that day something was planted inside me, a seed that I couldn't let go of. That night, in fact, I remember sneaking down after everyone was asleep and going onto the family's computer in the basement and logging on to the Dow website to see what the requirements would be for me to go to Dallas School. To this day, I remember the despair that I felt <laughs> when I saw those requirements. I had avoided sciences like the plague in high school, so to me, this might as well have been Greek. What the heck was I thinking? I climbed back into bed, tears in my eyes, but I didn't sleep a wink. For the rest of that year, I would spend every day after school and in the early evening prepping my grade five lesson plans. And then I would spend the rest of the evening studying high school sciences, history, chemistry, biology, or not history, sorry, chemistry, biology, and physics. And thankfully, I had a great tutor in Jeff, because little known fact, your Dean of Arts actually has an honors degree in chemistry. <laughs> Later that year, during March break, I went in to the Dal Dental School to have a meeting with the uh, Dean of Students and was told that in order for me to have a truly competitive application, I really needed to show that I was capable of holding down a full year of university science courses. So I realized then this was make or break. I needed to take the plunge and I quit my job. People thought I was nuts. Many of my colleagues, in fact, were not supportive at all accusing me that if every good teacher jumped ship, where would the system be? Part of me also thought I was nuts. I had a good job, a career job with benefits. I also still had those significant debts hanging over my head from all my schooling thus far. But my heart, my heart was screaming otherwise. As I wrestled with this, my very wise husband said to me, Aaron, if you can look me in the eye and tell me, that you'll be happy teaching for the next 35 years, I'll believe you, but I don't think you can. To which I replied, 35 years? <laughs> Sometimes being true to yourself means changing your mind. Self changes and you follow. So back to good old Acadia I came, this time enrolled in first year sciences. That year we were married, and Jeff was accepted to UBC for a master's, so I transferred to UBC for my second year of science. I want to pause for a second and tell you what a rude awakening that transfer was. I went from the small, beautiful, intimate classrooms of Acadia to the hugely anonymous campus of UBC. And I can tell you firsthand, both as a former educator and as a student, the education you folks are getting here at a small university is absolutely bar none superlative. Don't ever be fooled into thinking big, bigger is better. So after that second year, I wrote the DAT, applied to dental school at Dalhousie, and I was accepted in the year 2000. But truly the cost of this next big leg was my biggest fear. In fact, it was suffocating. I had the debts from my previous schooling and now I was faced with an insurmountable amount of debt that was to come. The answer to this came in an unsuspecting place. Just when my friends and family thought I'd thrown the last curveball, <laughs> I joined the Army. <laughs> the dental officer training program through the Canadian Forces allowed me to complete dental school at Civilian University at Dalhousie, what with them covering the costs of tuition and my fees. And then, at that point, 15 years ago, that was representing about just shy of $200,000. Now it's even more. The catch was that I had to do military training in the summers, and I had to work as a military dentist upon graduation for a minimum of four years. As far out as that seemed to everyone else in my life, I thought it was a great fit for me. I've always been very active, I work well in a regimented system, and I do play nice with others. 
I could easily see the benefits that would come from this opportunity. So off I went to basic training after my first year of dental school, and in the meantime discovered I'm a really good shot. <laughs> Who knew? We had our beautiful son Rory in fourth year of dental school. At six months old, after graduation, I had to leave him for two months to complete the second part of basic training, perhaps one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. But with the training behind me, I moved on to work as a Canadian Forces dentist with proud postings to CFB Kingston, the Royal Military College, and CFB Halifax, Stadacona, and Shearwater. While I truly enjoyed my time with the military, when I was told that I had been earmarked for a promotion posting to Goose Bay, Labrador, <laughs> We took a pretty hard look at, at, at our lives as a family. Jeff had a position here at Acadia, and Rory was getting ready to start school. So it didn't take long for me to decide that as much as I loved my military time, my family came first, and private practice here I come. I truly believe that your journey is never, ever complete and over. But I do feel that working now in private practice is exactly where I'm meant to be at this point in my life. And I do believe that every step that I took along the path has led me to where I am today. As a dentist, I own my own business. This is wonderful in so many ways, and someday I hope it means that I can get control over my work-life balance. Someday. But being a healthcare provider working outside of the tax-funded healthcare system is not without its challenges. It means that I'm constantly having to play two roles some of which, both of which feel at odds with one another. That as a healthcare provider, first and foremost, but also that as a business owner. Dentistry is an extremely expensive business to be in, and no one tells you that in dental school. Because the public doesn't see the true cost of their tax-funded healthcare system, most of the public assumes that dentistry is just overpriced and an elitist profession. It's exhausting to be continually having to justify and explain that the $200 paid for me to do a filling is not going into my pocket. It's going to employ the eight women who work with me to pay the bank loans for my large practice loan and to keep the lights on. With my other hat on as a healthcare provider, it's painful and heartbreaking for me to see the extent of the need out there. I could work pro bono 365 days a year and only scratch the surface. These are issues I struggle with as a business owner and a healthcare provider on a constant day, daily basis. And to be completely honest with you, I still don't have the answer. I haven't figured out the balance of those two things. I am often asked, however, if after studying science, I still believe it was worth it to study the arts. I've been asked, do you feel that studying the arts makes you a better dentist? And my answer is a resounding yes and yes. Not a day goes by that I don't draw on my arts, education, and science training, as well as my business experience as a young entrepreneur. Having training in both arts and sciences means that I often find I tackle a problem from both angles, perhaps differently than someone else may. For instance, in the sciences, you're taught to control for those extraneous factors in focused support of your succinct hypothesis. In the arts, you're encouraged to unpack the issue and explore its multiple layers of complexity. These two approaches initially might seem like they're in opposition of one another, but I would argue they're symbiotic. If we only examine a problem from one perspective, we might miss other important elements. And I'll use an example from my world. So recently, our office received a phone call from a person we'd never met. He was a man living in the US. He was calling regarding his 87-year-old mother, who was living in Nova Scotia. He was concerned because the caregivers that she was living with had concerns about the fact that she wasn't eating, and they didn't understand why. Him being in the US had no way of knowing, but his inkling was that she probably hadn't been to the dentist for quite some time. He also told me that the caregivers indicated that they suspected maybe there was something going on with her denture. I don't think it takes a dental degree to see that 
The denture isn't the only issue here. What you're looking at here is the back, the plastic, is a denture that normally hooks on to teeth. You can see the little wire clasps to the side of the pitcher. But what you're looking at in the front are abscessed roots of what remains of her teeth. So, if we look at this from purely a biomedical approach, it's quite simple. What's happened here is that the bacteria in our mouths, predominantly strep mutans, has used the sugars from this woman's food on a daily basis to produce acid, which mixes with the gooey plaque that forms on our teeth in the run of a day. And when that acidic plaque sits on the teeth, it starts to demineralize the enamel of your teeth. And that's the decay process. So it's pretty clear cut, very simple. And as a result, the solution is pretty clear cut. Reduce your sugar intake, brush your teeth, and maybe throw a little fluoride in there to strengthen that tooth structure so it's less prone to demineralization. Now I'm going to put on my arts hat because I feel like in isolation, the biomedical model alone ignores a whole host of other factors. And these are equally, if not more important factors. So I'm just gonna throw out a few that I can think of when I, when I sat down to put this together. Socioeconomic factors. What I haven't told you is that this woman is living in a long-term care facility. As I mentioned, she has no family in Nova Scotia, except for her 97-year-old husband, who has advanced dementia and lives in a hospital ward 200 kilometers away. She has limited finances with no disposable income. Then I would argue we need to look at arguments and, and factors of power where is the power in this woman's life? Does she hold the power? Does she hold her own independence? We look at things such as who controls her diet? Who controls her, her shopping? Who controls her transportation? Does she have someone that can help her with her personal hygiene? Then we look at questions of politics. Certainly in this province, the status of seniors' health care is dire. We also look at things such as resources for long-term care facilities, the training for the caregivers, the resources available for those caregivers to provide care for things like oral health. Then we can look at historic factors. This woman grew up and lived for the better part of her life in an extremely remote part of Nova Scotia, where access to a dentist was pretty much zero. So therefore, when there was a dental problem, Somebody at home usually took the tooth out. She did, however, have a few experiences with a dentist that were extremely upsetting for her. Very often with our elderly population, we will see this, that the, the, the rule of thumb had been, don't treat, just extract. So there's historical contexts here too. And then of course, we can't ignore the biomedical model. There are some really important factors here. She has just been diagnosed with early dementia. She has severe rheumatoid arthritis to the point that she can't even grip a fork, let alone a toothbrush. She's on a host of medications, many of which cause dry mouth. And we know in the dental community that that increases your risk of dental decay. And when her behavior becomes agitated due to her dementia, the caregivers provide her peppermints to eat, and that calms her. Peppermints are pure sugar. So that bacteria is just taking that sugar and turning it into an acid bath in her mouth. So I hope you can agree that this isn't just about too much sugar. And if you just brush your teeth, this wouldn't happen. I hope you can appreciate that by looking at all the factors, and all the elements at play, we can then start to maybe provide long-lasting solutions. And I would argue that any problem will benefit from such an approach. I don't care whether you're building a gas pipeline, whether you're teaching a child how to read, or whether you're treating an illness. By considering the various complexities, we can then think about creating long-lasting solutions 
rather than just managing the problem. I really feel it's unfortunate that in most of our Western culture, we, we, we create educational models that are structured such that we think of the arts and the sciences as opposing forces. We're taught often at an early age and an early point in our lives to think of it this way. And as a result, I'm living proof, we pigeonhole ourselves into one camp or the other. I'm either a science person or I'm an arts person. And as a result, I think our thinking becomes much more narrow. And when we have narrow thinking, we fail to see how our actions and decisions are connected to the greater world around us. I think Renaissance thinkers would be horrified to see how we've siloed the arts and the sciences. Leonardo da Vinci so simply stated, study the science of art, study the art of science, develop your senses, learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. As humans, we learn the most from experiences that push us just slightly outside of our comfort zone. However, slightly outside of our comfort zone is not a very comfortable place to exist. It's unsteady and it's unstable. So instead, more often than not, we lock ourselves in the familiar. We turn away from the unknown. We discount those who chart new paths and, heaven forbid, change their minds as indecisive or uncommitted. But I would argue that when you refuse to ever change your mind, you end up with fewer life tools in your toolbox. George Bernard Shaw said, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. So what is my message to you today? Now that I'm closer to the age of my tea party guests than I am to my six-year-old self. <laughs> it boils down really to three things. Don't be afraid to challenge what you think you believe. Be brave enough to take risks and have the courage to change your mind. Because metanoia is a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. So Erin, it is my pleasure on behalf of Wise Acadia and the planning committee and all the folks that have been so generous uh, with their support of Wise Acadia to provide you with this very small token of our appreciation. I can't even begin to tell you how much those messages resonate. And so I do hope that you heard, especially those last three points, um, it, it's really, really critical that we add the A to STEM, and I think, Erin, you've set us off on a wonderful path. So thank you so much for that. Yes,